Chapter 5 of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hill of Dreams. Chapter 5 And he was at last in the city of the unending murmuring streets, a part of the stirring shadow of the amber lighted gloom. It seemed a long time since he had knelt before his sweetheart in the lane the moon-fire streaming upon them from the dark circle of the fort, the air and the light in his soul full of haunting, the touch of the unimaginable thrilling his heart. And he now sat in a terrible bed-sitting room in a western suburb, confronted by a heap and litter of papers on the desk of a battered old bureau. He had put his breakfast tray out on the landing and was thinking of the morning's work, and of some very dubious pages that he had blackened the night before. But when he had lit his disreputable briar, he remembered there was an unopened letter waiting for him on the table. He had recognized the vague, staggering script of Miss Deacon, his cousin. There was not much news. His father was just the same as usual. There had been a good deal of rain. The farmers expected to make a lot of cider and so forth but at the close of the letter Miss Deacon became useful for reproof and admonition. "'I was at Carmen on Tuesday,' she said, "'and called on the Gervases and the Dixons. Mr. Gervais smiled when I told him you were a literary man living in London, and he said he was afraid you wouldn't find it a very practical career. Mrs. Gervais was very proud of Henry's success. He passed fifth for some examination and will begin with nearly four hundred a year.' I don't wonder the Gervases are delighted. Then I went to the Dixons and had tea. Mrs. Dixon wanted to know if you had published anything yet, and I said I thought not. She showed me a book everybody is talking about, called The Dog and the Doctor. She says it's selling by thousands, and that one can't take up a paper without seeing the author's name. She told me to tell you that you ought to try to write something like that. Then Mr. Dixon came in from the study, and your name was mentioned again. He said he was afraid you had made rather a mistake in trying to take up literature as if it were a profession, and seemed to think that a place in a house of business would be more suitable and more practical. He pointed out that you had not had the advantages of a university training, and said that you would find men who had made good friends and had the tone of the university would be before you at every step. He said Edward was doing very well at Oxford. He writes to them that he knows several noblemen, and that young Philip Bullingham, son of Sir John Bullingham, is his most intimate friend. Of course, this is very satisfactory for the Dixons. I am afraid, my dear Lucian, you have rather overrated your powers. Wouldn't it be better even now to look out for some real work to do, instead of wasting your time over those silly old books? I know quite well how the Gervases and the Dixons feel. They think idleness is so injurious for a young man, and likely to lead to bad habits. You know, my dear Lucian, I am only writing like this because of my affection for you, so I am sure, my dear boy, you won't be offended. Lucian pigeonholed the letter solemnly in the receptacle lettered Barbarians. He felt that he ought to ask himself some serious questions. Why haven't I passed fifth? Why isn't Philip, son of Sir John, my most intimate friend? Why am I an idler, liable to fall into bad habits? But he was eager to get to his work, a curious and intricate piece of analysis. So the battered bureau, the litter of papers, and the thick fume of his pipe engulfed him and absorbed him for the rest of the morning. Outside were the dim October mists, the dreary and languid life of a side street, and beyond, on the main road, the hum and jangle of the gliding trains. But he heard none of the uneasy noises of the quarter, not even the shriek of the garden gates, nor the yelp of the butcher on his round, for delight in his great task made him unconscious of the world outside. He had come by curious paths to this calm hermitage between Shepherd's Bush and Acton Vale. The golden weeks of the summer passed on in their enchanted procession, and Annie had not returned, neither had she written. Lucian, on his side, sat apart, 
wondering why his longing for her were not sharper. As he thought of his raptures, he would smile faintly to himself, and wonder whether he had not lost the world and Annie with it. In the garden of Avalonius, his sense of external things had grown dim and indistinct. The actual, material life seemed every day to become a show, a fleeting of shadows across a great white light. At last the news came that Annie Morgan had been married from her sister's house to a young farmer, to whom it appeared she had been long engaged, and Lucian was ashamed to find himself only conscious of amusement, mingled with gratitude. She had been the key that opened the shut palace, and he was now secure on the throne of ivory and gold. A few days after he had heard the news, he repeated the adventure of his boyhood. For the second time he scaled the steep hillside, and penetrated the matted brake. He expected violent disillusion, but his feeling was rather astonishment at the activity of boyish imagination. There was no terror nor amazement now in the green bulwarks, and the stunted undergrowth did not seem in any way extraordinary. Yet he did not laugh at the memory of his sensations. He was not angry at the cheat. Certainly it had been all illusion, all the heats and chills of boyhood. Its thoughts of terror were without significance. But he recognized that the illusions of the child only differed from those of the man in that they were more picturesque. Belief in fairies and belief in the stock exchange as bestowers of happiness were equally vain. But the latter form of faith was ugly as well as inept. It was better, he knew, and wiser, to wish for a fairy coach than to cherish longings for a well-appointed broom and liveried servants. He turned his back on the green walls and the dark oaks without any feeling of regret or resentment. After a little while he began to think of his adventures with pleasure. The ladder by which he had mounted had disappeared, but he was safe on the height. By the chance fancy of a beautiful girl he had been redeemed from a world of misery and torture the world of external things into which he had become a stranger by which he had been tormented. He looked back at a kind of vision of himself, seen as he was a year before, a pitiable creature burning and twisting on the hot coals of the pit, crying lamentably to the laughing bystanders for but one drop of cold water wherewith to cool his tongue. He confessed to himself, with some contempt, that he had been a social being, depending for his happiness on the good will of others. He had tried hard to write, chiefly, it was true, from the love of the art, but a little from a social motive. He had imagined that a written book and the praise of responsible journals would ensure him the respect of the county people. It was a quaint idea, and he saw the lamentable fallacies naked. In the first place, a painstaking artist in words was not respected by the respectable. Secondly, books should not be written with the object of gaining the good will of the landed and commercial interests. Thirdly, and chiefly, no man should in any way depend on another. From this utter darkness, from danger of madness, the ever dear and sweet Annie had rescued him. Very beautifully and fitly, as Lucian thought, she had done her work without any desire to benefit him. She had simply willed to gratify her own passion, and in doing this had handed to him the priceless secret. And he, on his side, had reversed the process, merely to make himself a splendid offering for the acceptance of his sweetheart. He had cast aside the vain world and had found the truth, which now remained with him precious and enduring." and since the news of the marriage he found that his worship of her had by no means vanished. Rather in his heart was the eternal treasure of a happy love, untarnished and spotless. It would be like a mirror of gold without alloy, bright and lustrous forever. For Lucian it was no defect in the woman that she was desirous and faithless. He had not conceived an affection for certain moral or intellectual accidents, but for the very woman. Guided by the self-evident axiom that humanity is to be judged by literature and not literature by humanity, 
he detected the analogy between Lycidas and Annie. Only the dullard would object to the nauseous cant of the one, or to the indiscretions of the other. A sober critic might say that the man who could generalize Herbert and Laud, Don and Herrick, Sanderson and Juxon, Hammond and Lancelot Andrews into our corrupted clergy, must be either an imbecile, or a scoundrel, or probably both. The judgment would be perfectly true, but as a criticism of Lycidas it would be a piece of folly. In the case of the woman one could imagine the attitude of the conventional lover, of the chevalier, who with his tongue in cheek reverences and respects all women, and coming home early in the morning writes a leading article on St. English Girl. Lucian, on the other hand, felt profoundly grateful to the delicious Annie, because she had at precisely the right moment voluntarily removed her image from his way. He confessed to himself that, latterly, he had a little dreaded her return as an interruption. He had shivered at the thought that their relations would become what was so terribly called an intrigue or affair. There would be all the threadbare and common stratagems, the vulgarity of secret assignations, and an atmosphere suggesting the period of Mr. Thomas More and Lord Byron and cigars. Lucian had been afraid of all this. He had feared lest love itself should destroy love. He considered that now, freed from the torment of the body, leaving untasted the green water that makes thirst more burning, he was perfectly initiated in the true knowledge of the splendid and glorious love. There seemed to him a monstrous paradox in the assertion that there could be no true love without a corporeal presence of the beloved. Even the popular sayings of, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and familiarity breeds contempt, witness to the contrary. He thought, sighing, and with compassion, of the manner in which men are continually led astray by the cheat of their senses. In order that the unborn might still be added to the born, Nature had inspired men with the wild delusion that the bodily companionship of the lover and the beloved was desirable above all things, and so, by the false show of pleasure, the human race was chained to vanity and doomed to an eternal thirst for the non-existent. Again and again he gave thanks for his own escape. He had been set free from a life of vice and sin and folly from all the dangers and illusions that are most dreaded by the wise. He laughed as he remembered what would be the common view of the situation. An ordinary lover would suffer all the sting of sorrow and contempt. There would be grief for a lost mistress, and rage at her faithlessness, and hate in the heart. One foolish passion driving on another, and driving the man to ruin." for what would be commonly called the real woman he cared nothing. If he had heard that she had died in her farm in utter Gwent, he would have experienced only a passing sorrow, such as he might feel at the death of any one he had once known. But he did not think of the young farmer's wife as the real Annie. He did not think of the frost-bitten leaves in winter as the real rose. Indeed, the life of many reminded him of the flowers, perhaps more especially of those flowers which to all appearance are for many years but dull and dusty clumps of green, and suddenly, in one night, burst into the flame of blossom, and fill all the misty lawns with odor. Till the morning. It was in that night that the flower lived, not through the long, unprofitable years. And in like manner, many human lives, he thought, were born in the evening and dead before the coming of day. But he had preserved the precious flower in all its glory, not suffering it to wither in the hard light, but keeping it in a secret place, where it could never be destroyed. Truly now, and for the first time, he possessed Annie, as a man possesses the gold which he has dug from the rock and purged of its baseness. He was musing over these things when a piece of news, very strange and unexpected, arrived at the rectory. A distant, almost a mythical relative, known from childhood as Cousin Edward in the Isle of Wight, had died, and by some strange freak had left Lucian two thousand pounds. 
It was a pleasure to give his father five hundred pounds, and the rector, on his side, forgot for a couple of days to lean his head on his hand. For the rest of the capital, which was well invested, Lucian found he would derive something between sixty and seventy pounds a year, and his old desires for literature and a refuge in the murmuring streets returned to him. He longed to be free from the incantations that surrounded him in the country, to work and live in a new atmosphere, and so, with many good wishes from his father, he came to the retreat in the waste places of London. He was in high spirits when he found the square, clean room, horribly furnished, in the by-street that branched from the main road and advanced in an unlovely sweep to the mud-pits and the desolation that was neither town nor country. On every side monotonous grey streets, each house the replica of its neighbour, to the east an unexplored wilderness, north and west and south the brick-fields and market-gardens, everywhere the ruins of the country, the tracks where sweet lanes had been, gangrened stumps of trees, the relics of hedges, here and there an oak stripped of its bark, white and haggard and leprous, like a corpse. And the air seemed always grey, and the smoke from the brickfields was grey. At first he scarcely realized the quarter into which chance had led him. His only thought was of the great adventure of letters in which he proposed to engage, and his first glance round his bed-sitting-room showed him that there was no piece of furniture suitable for his purpose. The table, like the rest of the suite, was of bird's-eye maple, but the maker seemed to have penetrated the druidic secret of the rocking-stone. The thing was in a state of unstable equilibrium perpetually. For some days he wandered through the streets, inspecting the second-hand furniture shops, and at last, in a forlorn byway, found an old Japanese bureau, dishonored and forlorn, standing against rusty bedsteads, sorry china and all the refuse of homes dead and desolate. The bureau pleased him in spite of its grime and grease and dirt. Inlaid mother of pearl, the gleam of lacquer dragons in red gold, and hints of curious design shone through the film of neglect and ill-usage and when the woman of the shop showed him the drawers and well and pigeonholes, he saw that it would be an apt instrument for his studies. The bureau was carried to his room and replaced the bird's-eye table under the gas-jet, as Lucine arranged what papers he had accumulated, the sketches of hopeless experiments, shreds and tatters of stories begun but never completed, outlines of plots, two or three notebooks scribbled through and through with impressions of the abandoned hills, he felt a thrill of exultation at the prospect of work to be accomplished, of a new world all open before him. He set out on the adventure with a fury of enthusiasm. His last thought at night, when all the maze of streets was empty and silent, was of the problem, and his dreams ran on phrases, and when he awoke in the morning, he was eager to get back to his desk. He immersed himself in a minute, almost a microscopic analysis of fine literature. It was no longer enough, as in the old days, to feel the charm and incantation of a line or a word. He wished to penetrate the secret, to understand something of the wonderful suggestion, all apart from the sense that seemed to him the differentia of literature as distinguished from the long follies of character-drawing, psychological analysis, and all the stuff that went to make the three-volume novel of commerce. He found himself curiously strengthened by the change from the hills to the streets. There could be no doubt, he thought, that living a lonely life, interested only in himself and his own thoughts, he had become in a measure inhuman. The form of external things— black depths in woods, pools in lonely places, those still valleys curtained by hills on every side, sounding always with the ripple of their brooks, had become to him an influence like that of a drug, giving a certain peculiar color and outline to his thoughts. And from early boyhood there had been another strange flavor in his life, the dream of the old Roman world, those curious impressions that he had gathered from the white walls of Carmen, and from the looming bastions of the fort. 
It was, in reality, the subconscious fancies of many years that had rebuilt the Golden City, and had shown him the vine trellis and the marbles and the sunlight in the garden of Avalonius. And the rapture of love had made it all so vivid and warm with life that even now, when he had let his pen drop, the rich noise of the tavern and the chant of the theatre sounded above the murmur of the streets. Looking back, it was as much a part of his life as his school days, and the tessellated pavements were as real as the square of faded carpet beneath his feet. But he felt that he had escaped. He could now survey those splendid and lovely visions from without, as if he read of opium dreams, and he no longer dreaded a weird suggestion that had once beset him, that his very soul was being molded into the hills, and passing into the black mirror of still water-pools. He had taken refuge in the streets, in the harbor of a modern suburb, from the vague, dreaded magic that had charmed his life. Whenever he felt inclined to listen to the old wood-whisper or to the singing of the fawns, he bent more earnestly to his work, turning a deaf ear to the incantations. In the curious labor of the bureau, he found refreshment that was continually renewed. He experienced again, and with a far more violent impulse, the enthusiasm that had attended the writing of his book a year or two before, and so, perhaps, passed from one drug to another. It was, indeed, with something of rapture that he imagined the great procession of years all to be devoted to the intimate analysis of words, to the construction of the sentence, as if it were a piece of jewelry or mosaic. Sometimes, in the pauses of the work, he would pace up and down his cell, looking out of the window now and again and gazing for an instant into the melancholy street. As the year advanced, the days grew more and more misty, and he found himself the inhabitant of a little island wreathed about with the waves of a white and solemn sea. In the afternoon the fog would grow denser, shutting out not only sight but sound. The shriek of the garden gates, the jangling of the tram-bell, echoed as if from a far way. Then there were days of heavy, incessant rain. He could see a gray drifting sky and the drops plashing in the street, and the houses all dripping and saddened with wet. He cured himself of one great aversion. He was no longer nauseated at the sight of a story begun and left unfinished. Formerly, even when an idea rose in his mind bright and wonderful, he had always approached the paper with a feeling of sickness and dislike, remembering all the hopeless beginnings he had made but now he understood that to begin a romance was almost a separate and special art, a thing apart from the story, to be practiced with sedulous care. Whenever an opening scene occurred to him, he noted it roughly in a book, and he devoted many long winter evenings to the elaboration of these beginnings. Sometimes the first impression would yield only a paragraph or a sentence, and once or twice but a splendid and sonorous word which seemed to Lucian all dim and rich with unsurmised adventure. But often he was able to write three or four vivid pages, studying above all things the hint and significance of the words and actions, striving to work into the lines the atmosphere of the expectation and promise, and the murmur of wonderful events to come. In this one department of his task the labor seemed almost endless. He would finish a few pages and then rewrite them, using the same incident and nearly the same words, but altering that indefinite something which is scarcely so much style as manner or atmosphere. He was astonished at the enormous change that was thus effected, and often, though he himself had done the work, he could scarcely describe in words how it was done. But it was clear that in this art of manner or suggestion lay all the chief secrets of literature, that by it all the great miracles were performed. Clearly it was not style, for style in itself was untranslatable, but it was that high theurgic magic that made the English Don Quixote, roughly traduced by some Gervas, perhaps the best of all English books. 
and it was the same element that made the journey of Roderick Random to London, so ostensibly a narrative of coarse jokes and common experiences and burlesque manners, told in no very choice diction, essentially a wonderful vision of the eighteenth century, carrying to one's very nostrils the aroma of the great north road, iron-bound under black frost, darkened beneath shuddering woods, haunted by highwaymen, with an adventure waiting beyond every turn, and great old echoing inns in the midst of lonely winter lands. It was this magic that Lucian sought for his opening chapters. He tried to find that quality that gives to words something beyond their sound and beyond their meaning, that in the first lines of a book should whisper things unintelligible but all significant. Often he worked for many hours without success, and the grim wet dawn once found him still searching for hieroglyphic sentences, for words mystical, symbolic. On the shelves, in the upper part of his bureau, he had placed the books which, however various as to matter, seemed to have a part in this curious quality of suggestion, and in that sphere which might almost be called supernatural. To these books he had often had recourse, when further effort appeared altogether hopeless, and certain pages in Coleridge and Edgar Allan Poe had the power of holding him in a trance of delight, subject to emotions and impressions which he knew to transcend altogether the realm of the formal understanding. Such lines as, Bottomless veils and boundless floods, and chasms and caves and titan woods, with forms that no man can discover, for the dews that drip all over had for Lucian more than the potency of a drug, lulling him into a splendid waking sleep, every word being a supreme incantation. And it was not only his mind that was charmed by such passages, for he felt at the same time a strange and delicious bodily languor that held him motionless, without the desire or power to stir him from his seat." and there were certain phrases in Kubla Khan that had such a magic that he would sometimes wake up, as it were, to the consciousness that he had been lying on the bed or sitting in the chair by the bureau, repeating a single line over and over again for two or three hours. Yet he knew perfectly well that he had not been really asleep. A little effort recalled a constant impression of the wallpaper with its pink flowers on a buff ground, and of the muslin-curtained window letting in the grey winter light. He had been some seven months in London when this odd experience first occurred to him. The day opened dreary and cold and clear, with a gusty and restless wind whirling round the corner of the street, and lifting the dead leaves and scraps of paper that littered the roadway into eddying mounting circles, as if a storm of black rain were to come. Lucian had sat late the night before, and rose in the morning feeling weary and listless and heavy-headed. While he dressed, his legs dragged him as with weights, and he staggered and nearly fell in bending down to the mat outside for his tea-tray. He lit the spirit lamp on the hearth with shaking, unsteady hands, and could scarcely pour out the tea when it was ready. A delicate cup of tea was one of his few luxuries. He was fond of the strange flavor of the green leaf, and this morning he drank the straw-colored liquid eagerly, hoping it would disperse the cloud of languor. He tried his best to coerce himself into the sense of vigor and enjoyment with which he usually began the day, walking briskly up and down and arranging his papers in order. But he could not free himself from depression. Even as he opened the dear bureau, a wave of melancholy came upon him, and he began to ask himself whether he were not pursuing a vain dream, searching for treasures that had no existence. He drew out his cousin's letter and read it again, sadly enough. After all, there was a good deal of truth in what she said. He had overrated his powers. He had no friends, no real education. He began to count up the months since he had come to London. He had received his two thousand pounds in March, and in May he had said good-bye to the woods and to the dear and friendly paths. 
May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and half of December had gone by. And what had he to show? Nothing but the experiment, the attempt, futile scribblings which had no end nor shining purpose. There was nothing in his desk that he could produce as evidence of his capacity, no fragment even of accomplishment. It was a thought of intense bitterness, but it seemed as if the barbarians were in the right. A place in a house of business would have been more suitable. He leaned his head on his desk, overwhelmed with the severity of his own judgment. He tried to comfort himself again by the thought of all the hours of happy enthusiasm he had spent amongst his papers, working for a great idea with infinite patience. He recalled to mind something that he had always tried to keep in the background of his hopes, the foundation stone of his life, which he had hidden out of sight. Deep in his heart was the hope that he might one day write a valiant book. He scarcely dared to entertain the aspiration. He felt his incapacity too deeply. But yet his longing was the foundation of all his painful and patient effort. This he had proposed in secret to himself, that if he labored without ceasing, without tiring, he might produce something which would at all events be art, which would stand wholly apart from the objects shaped like books, printed with printer's ink and called by the name of books that he had read. Giotto, he knew, was a painter, and the man who imitated walnut wood on the deal doors opposite was a painter, and he wished to be a very humble pupil in the class of the former. It was better, he thought, to fail in attempting exquisite things than to succeed in the department of the utterly contemptible. He had vowed he would be the dunce of Cervantes's school rather than top-boy in the academy of a badon de beat, and Millicent's marriage— and with this purpose he had devoted himself to laborious and joyous years, so that, however mean his capacity, the pain should not be wanting. He tried now to rouse himself from a growing misery by the recollection of this high aim, but it all seemed hopeless vanity. He looked out into the gray street, and it stood a symbol of his life, chill and dreary and gray and vexed with a horrible wind." There were the dull inhabitants of the quarter going about their common business. A man was crying mackerel in a doleful voice, slowly passing up the street and staring into the white-curtained parlors, searching for the face of a purchaser behind the India-rubber plants, stuffed birds, and piles of gaudy gilt books that adorned the windows. One of the blistered doors over the way banged, and a woman came scurrying out on some errand and the garden-gate shrieked two melancholy notes as she opened it and let it swing back after her. The little patches called gardens were mostly untilled, uncared for, squares of slimy moss, dotted with clumps of coarse ugly grass. But here and there were the blackened and rotting remains of sunflowers and marigolds. And beyond, he knew, stretched the labyrinth of streets, more or less squalid, but all gray and dull, and behind were the mud pits and the steaming heaps of yellowish bricks, and to the north was a great wide cold waste, treeless, desolate, swept by bitter wind. It was all like his own life, he said again to himself, a maze of unprofitable dreariness and desolation, and his mind grew as black and hopeless as the winter sky. The morning went thus dismally till twelve o'clock, and he put on his hat and greatcoat. He always went out for an hour every day between twelve and one. The exercise was a necessity, and the landlady made his bed in the interval. The wind blew the smoke from the chimneys into his face as he shut the door, and with the acrid smoke came the prevailing odor of the street, a blend of cabbage water and burnt bones and the faint sickly vapor from the brickfields. Lucian walked mechanically for the hour, going eastward along the main road. The wind pierced him, and the dust was blinding, and the dreariness of the street increased his misery. The row of common shops, full of common things, the blatant public houses, the independent chapel, a horrible stucco parody of a Greek temple with a façade of hideous columns that was a nightmare, 
villas like smug Pharisees, shops again, a church in cheap Gothic, an old garden blasted and riven by the builder. These were the pictures of the way. When he got home again, he flung himself on the bed, and lay there stupidly till sheer hunger roused him. He ate a hunch of bread and drank some water, and began to pace up and down the room, wondering whether there were no escape from despair. Writing seemed quite impossible, and hardly knowing what he did, he opened his bureau and took out a book from the shelves. As his eyes fell on the page, and the air grew dark and heavy as night, and the wind wailed suddenly, loudly, terribly. By woman wailing for her demon lover. The words were on his lips when he raised his eyes again. A broad band of pale clear light was shining into the room, and when he looked out of the window, he saw the road all brightened by glittering pools of water, and, as the last drops of the rainstorm starred these mirrors, the sun sank into the rack. Lucian gazed about him, perplexed, till his eyes fell on the clock above his empty hearth. He had been sitting motionless for nearly two hours, without any sense of the passage of time, and without ceasing he had murmured those words as he dreamed an endless wonderful story. He experienced somewhat the sensations of Coleridge himself. Strange, amazing, ineffable things seemed to have been presented to him, not in the form of the idea, but actually and materially, but he was less fortunate than Coleridge and that he could not, even vaguely, image to himself what he had seen. Yet, when he searched his mind, he knew that the consciousness of the room in which he sat had never left him. He had seen the thick darkness gather, and had heard the whirl of rain hissing through the air. Windows had been shut down with a crash. He had noted the pattering of footsteps of people running to shelter, the landlady's voice crying to someone to look at the rain coming in under the door. It was like peering into some old bituminous picture. One could see at last that the mere blackness resolved itself into the likeness of trees and rocks and travelers. And against this background of his room, and the storm, and the noises of the street, his vision stood out illuminated. He felt he had descended to the very depths, into the caverns that are hollowed beneath the soul. He tried vainly to record the history of his impressions. The symbols remained in his memory, but the meaning was all conjecture. The next morning, when he awoke, he could scarcely understand or realize the bitter depression of the preceding day. He found it had all vanished away and had been succeeded by an intense exultation. Afterwards, when at rare intervals he experienced the same strange possession of the consciousness, he found this to be the invariable result. The hour of vision was always succeeded by a feeling of delight, by sensations of brightened and intensified powers. On that bright December day, after the storm, he rose joyously and set about the labor of the Bureau with the assurance of success, almost with the hope of formidable difficulties to be overcome. He had long busied himself with those curious researches which Poe had indicated in The Philosophy of Composition, and many hours had been spent in analyzing the singular effects which may be produced by the sound and resonance of words. But he had been struck by the thought that in the finest literature there were more subtle tones than the loud and insistent music of Nevermore and he endeavored to find the secret of those pages and sentences which spoke less directly and less obviously to the soul rather than to the ear, being filled with a certain grave melody and the sensation of singing voices. It was admirable, no doubt, to write phrases that showed at a glance their designed rhythm and rang with sonorous words, but he dreamed of a prose in which the music should be less explicit of names rather than notes. He was astonished that morning at his own fortune and facility. He succeeded in covering a page of ruled paper wholly to his satisfaction, and the sentences, when he read them out, appeared to suggest a weird elusive chanting, exquisite but almost imperceptible, like the echo of the plain song reverberated from the vault of a monastic church. 
He thought that such happy mornings well repaid him for the anguish of depression which he sometimes had to suffer, and for the strange experience of possession recurring at rare intervals, and usually after many weeks of severe diet. His income, he found, amounted to sixty-five pounds a year, and he lived for weeks at a time on fifteen shillings a week. During these austere periods his only food was bread at the rate of a loaf a day, but he drank huge draughts of green tea and smoked a black tobacco, which seemed to him a more potent mother of thought than any drug from the scented East. "'I hope you go to some nice place for dinner,' wrote his cousin. "'There used to be some excellent eating-houses in London where one could get a good cut from the joint, with plenty of gravy, and a boiled potato for a shilling.' Aunt Mary writes that you should try Mr. Jones's in Water Street, Islington, whose father came from near Carmen, and was always most comfortable in her day. I dare say the walk there would do you good. It is such a pity you smoke that horrid tobacco. I had a letter from Mrs. Dolly, Jane Diggs, who married your cousin John Dolly, the other day, and she said they would have been delighted to take you for only twenty-five shillings a week for the sake of the family if you had not been a smoker." She told me to ask you if you had ever seen a horse or a dog smoking tobacco. They are such nice, comfortable people, and the children would have been company for you. Johnny, who used to be such a dear little fellow, has just gone into an office in the city, and seems to have excellent prospects. How I wish, my dear Lucian, that you could do something in the same way. Don't forget Mr. Jones is in Water Street, and you might mention your name to him. Lucian never troubled Mr. Jones, but these letters of his cousin's always refreshed him by the force of contrast. He tried to imagine himself a part of the Dolly family, going dutifully every morning to the city on the bus, and returning in the evening for high tea. He could conceive the fine odor of hot roast beef hanging about the decorous house on Sunday afternoons, Papa asleep in the dining-room, Mama lying down, and the children quite good and happy with their Sunday's books. In the evening, after supper, one read the quiver till bedtime. Such pictures as these were to Lucian a comfort and a help, a remedy against despair. Often, when he felt overwhelmed by the difficulty of the work he had undertaken, he thought of the alternative career and was strengthened. He returned again and again to that desire of a prose, which should sound faintly, not so much with an audible music, but with the memory and echo of it. In the night, when the last tram had gone jangling by, and he had looked out and seen the street all wrapped about in heavy folds of the mist, he conducted some of his most delicate experiments. In that white and solitary midnight of the suburban street, he experienced the curious sense of being on a tower, remote and apart and high above all the troubles of the earth. The gas lamp, which was nearly opposite, shone in a pale halo of light, and the houses themselves were merely indistinct marks and shadows amidst that palpable whiteness, shutting out the world and its noises. The knowledge of the swarming life that was so still, though it surrounded him, made the silence seem deeper than that of the mountains before the dawn. It was as if he alone stirred and looked out amidst a host sleeping at his feet. The fog came in by the open window in freezing puffs, and as Lucian watched he noticed that it shook and wavered like the sea, tossing up wreaths and drifts across the pale halo of the lamp, and, these vanishing, others succeeded. It was as if the mist passed by from the river to the north, as if it still passed by in the silence. He would shut his window gently and sit down in his lighted room, with all the consciousness of the white advancing shroud upon him. It was then that he found himself in the mood for curious labors, and able to handle with some touch of confidence the more exquisite instruments of the craft. He sought for that magic by which all the glory and glamour of mystic chivalry were made to shine through the burlesque and gross adventures of Don Quixote, by which Hawthorne had lit his infernal Sabbath fires, 
and fashioned a burning aureole about the village tragedy of the Scarlet Letter. In Hawthorne, the story and the suggestion, though quite distinct and of different worlds, were rather parallel than opposed to one another. But Cervantes had done a stranger thing. One read of Don Quixote, beaten, dirty, and ridiculous, mistaking windmills for giants, sheep for an army, but the impression was of the enchanted forest, of Avalon, of the San Graal, far in the spiritual city. And Rabelais showed him, beneath the letter, the Turanian sun shining on the hot rock above Chinon, on the maze of narrow, climbing streets, on the high-pitched gabled roofs, on the grey-blue Tourelle, pricking upward from the fantastic labyrinth of walls. He heard the sound of sonorous plain-song from the monastic choir, of gross exuberant gaiety from the rich vineyards. He listened to the eternal mystic mirth of those that halted in the purple shadow of the sorbier by the white steep road. The gracious and ornate chateau on the Loire and the Vienne rose fair and shining to confront the incredible secrets of vast, dim, far-lifted Gothic knaves that seemed ready to take the great deep and float away from the mist and dust of earthly streets to anchor in the haven of the clear city that hath foundations. The rank tale of the garderobe of the farm kitchen mingled with the reasoned, endless legend of the schools, with luminous platonic argument. The old pomp of the Middle Ages put on the robe of a fresh life. There was a smell of wine and of incense, of June meadows and of ancient books, and through it all he hearkened intent to the exultation of chiming bells ringing for a new feast in a new land. He would cover pages with the analysis of these marvels, tracking the suggestion concealed beneath the words, and yet glowing like the golden threads in a robe of Samite, or like that device of the old binders by which a vivid picture appeared on the shut edges of a book. He tried to imitate this art, to summon even the faint shadow of the great effect, rewriting a page of Hawthorne, experimenting and changing an epithet here and there, noting how sometimes the alteration of a trifling word would plunge a whole scene into darkness, as if one of those blood-red fires had instantly been extinguished. Sometimes, for severe practice, he attempted to construct short tales in the manner of this or that master. He sighed over these desperate attempts, over the clattering pieces of mechanism which would not even simulate life. But he urged himself to an infinite perseverance. Through the white hours he worked on amidst the heap and litter of papers. Books and manuscripts overflowed from the bureau to the floor and if he looked out he saw the mist still pass by, still passing from the river to the north. It was not till the winter was well advanced that he began at all to explore the region in which he lived. Soon after his arrival in the Grey Street he had taken one or two vague walks, hardly noticing where he went or what he saw. But for all the summer he had shut himself in his room, beholding nothing but the form and color of words. For his morning walk he almost invariably chose the one direction, going along the Uxbridge Road towards Notting Hill and returning by the same monotonous thoroughfare. Now, however, when the new year was beginning its dull days, he began to diverge occasionally to right and left, sometimes eating his luncheon in odd corners, in the bulging parlors of eighteenth-century taverns, that still fronted the surging sea of modern streets, or perhaps in brand-new publics on the broken borders of the brickfields, smelling of the clay from which they had swollen. He found waste by-places behind railway embankments where he could smoke his pipe sheltered from the wind. Sometimes there was a wooden fence by an old pear orchard where he sat and gazed at the wet desolation of the market gardens, munching a few currant biscuits by way of dinner. As he went farther afield, a sense of immensity slowly grew upon him. It was as if, from the little island of his room, that one friendly place, he pushed out into the gray unknown, into a city that for him was uninhabited as the desert. 
He came back to his cell after these purposeless wanderings always with a sense of relief, with the thought of taking refuge from Gray. As he lit the gas and opened the desk of his bureau and saw the pile of papers awaiting him, it was as if he had passed from the black skies and the stinging wind and the dull maze of the suburb into all the warmth and sunlight and violent color of the South. End of chapter 5